Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. We should not be in any way becoming frustrated when we see things transpiring. I mean, I know a lot of people right now are frustrated of what they see going on in God's church. They're frustrated with what they see going on in the world. Everything is orchestrated by God. Do we believe that? Do we believe that God is a God of order? Yes. Let's look this morning. If God can place the entire universe in perfect order, don't you think he can control this earth? Don't you think he can place everything in perfect order in your life? But the problem is, is that we must have faith. And that's what we lack is faith. Now God is truly a God of order. And what we looked at the other night, and we're going to take a moment because we need to back up and catch everybody up to where we were. God is a perfect God of order. You shouldn't be surprised at the things transpiring in God's church. Even though they're transpiring, it's still God's church. Amen. It is God's church, and it's not to be broken up into independent atoms with this person doing their thing and that person doing their thing. God is calling us to pull together. Push together. But what the problem is, is when the lion roars too often, we all scatter. And that's how the lion can devour his prey, is when people start scattering in different directions. Now follow me this morning, please. God will arouse his people if other means fail. Heresies will come in among them, which will sift them, separating the chaff from the wheat. So what we, dis what we discovered the other night is God is using the ministry of heresy in his church to awaken his people. Are you with me? God is allowing heresy of all different kinds to come into his church to arouse his people to awake them to the times that we live in. And we shouldn't become discouraged. What we should say is, we have a prophet that foretold everything. And I told you last night, and I will tell you again, you cannot be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian if you do not believe in the prophecy of Ellen G. White. Amen. If you don't believe in Ellen G. White, you are not a Seventh-day Adventist. And you need to become a Seventh-day Adventist so that you can give this loud cry to the sheep that are not of this fold. It says, the Lord calls upon all who believe his word to awake out of sleep. Precious light has come appropriate for this time. It is Bible truth showing the perils that are right upon us. The light should lead us to a diligent study of the scripture and a most critical examination of the position of which we hold. So what should this do? As we see this, all of a sudden it should be like an alarm clock going off to us, waking us up to that we are in trouble as a people, and God is in doing his last moments of work to try to wake us up to either be a part of this team or not to be a part. The problem we have today is there's a lot of people that want to tear down instead of build up. I was at a, I was at a place down in Oklahoma about a year ago, and there was a a speaker down there, a reform speaker, so to speak. And he had just, just preached a sermon. And I mean, he kicked everything you can kick about the church. Just kicked it raw. And I had to preach next. And I'm sitting there on the, on the bench. And I'm saying, Lord, what do I get up and say to this? What do I get up and say, Lord? Because, see, you don't want to start a big controversy, and then all of a sudden you got a big split in the church, and nobody's listening and everything. So I said, Lord, please. And the Lord just, just gave me peace to just get up. But he didn't tell me anything to say. And as I got up towards the front, and I started walking up, the Lord said, walk to the blackboard. And I'm going to show you exactly what he told me to do. Let me use this black pen. The Lord said, walk up to the, to the easel board. And he said, walk up there and write 99% on the board and write 1% below it. Okay? And so I did. The Lord didn't tell me another thing. He said, now pray. And I got down on my knees and I opened up in prayer. And as I got up off my knees, the Lord said, walk back to the blackboard. He said, you know what? There's a lot of people that want to talk about 99% of the problems and 1% of a solution. Wow. And he said, when you reverse these and you talk about 1% of the problem and 99% of the solution, all of a sudden we're going to start having victory as a church. <laughs> the problem is we talk about all the problems, but we don't talk about anything about how to have victory. We don't talk about anything, how to solve the problems. 
And there's only one thing that can solve the problem today, and that's Jesus Christ. And that's Christ in us, the hope of glory. God never had desired his people in any way, shape, or form to be in the condition they are as a people. Divided. There's no division in God. Look what the Bible says. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 5 says, One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And look with me again, brothers and sisters, again I apologize for going over this again, but the Lord said go over it. And so we're going to go over it. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So what does it mean, one Lord? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. And let's look what the, what the, what the, what the Bible is saying. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and let's begin with verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 10. And the Bible says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no what? There be no what? There be no divisions among you. Are there divisions among us as God's people? You know what? You know what honestly makes me more sick than anything? And this is why Brother Mason and I teamed up to go around this country to show people. Do you realize that we are the only denomination, the only denomination that has white conferences and black conferences and Hispanic conferences? What on earth? You look at Joel Osteen's church packed to the rafters, 75,000 people, and it's a mix of every race there is. And we're the people that is supposed to be God's people. And we're a segregated people. And we're supposed to be taking the gospel to the world? You've got to be kidding me. We can't, even give, we can't even pull together as God's people amongst ourselves, let alone take the message to the world. Lord, have mercy on us. It says right here that an open door. Christ has presented always before us an open door. Always. And what we have to be willing to do is follow Christ through that open door. We must always walk with Christ wherever he is. And I'm telling you, if you won't walk with him here, you'll never walk with him in heaven, so you won't be there. An open door. Jesus says, I have set before you an open door and no man can shut it. No man can shut it on any of us, but we can shut it on ourselves. If we refuse to walk, it's shut. God said, you follow me, please. Now, from sin to the cross, we had the outer court. Can everyone see? I'll take this down. You can't? Can you see? You can't? I'm going to need it in a minute. It's the only reason. From sin to the cross, it was in the outer court. From the ascension to 1844, it was where? In the holy place. From 1844 to the present, it's in the most holy place. Are we all together? See, we do not understand the sanctuary the way we need to. And you know what? That is our message. That's our whole message. And that's the message that the devil is trying to steal from this church. Because without this message, we're the, we're, we're the same as the evangelicals. So look, when the Jews, let me back up here for a second. When the, when, when, the, when the Jews rejected Christ, they were unwilling to walk with him by faith to meet him in the holy place. Many of them stayed in the outer court. In fact, there's still Jews today that are sacrificing, waiting for the Messiah to come. Why? Because they were unwilling to go with him into the holy place. But now like the Jews, she says, I saw that as the Jews crucified Jesus, those the nominal churches had crucified these messages. We're speaking of the time period of 1844, and the message that were crucified was the three angels' message. It says, and therefore they had no knowledge of the way into the most holy, and they cannot be benefited by the intercession of Jesus there. When you don't follow him, you're not receiving the benefit of Christ. So it goes on to say, like the Jews who offered up their useless sacrifices, they offer up their useless prayers to an apartment which Jesus has already left. See, you can stay in the apartment, but Jesus has already left. Now the devil, look what, and Satan, pleased with the deception, assumes a religious character and leads the minds of these professed Christians to himself, working with his power, his signs and lying wonders to fasten them in his snares. So when you don't move forward, all of a sudden the devil's there to say, you don't have to go. You don't have to move forward at all. You're flying right where you're at. 
You're perfectly fine. Just stay there. But now let's see what's happened. Why do we have what we have in God's church today? What is this a picture of? The sanctuary. Okay? Now some of you saw this the other night. What is this a picture of? Now, there's a masterful deception here. What is it? Okay? Now, ladies, we talked about the other night. When we get bored with God, when you, when you get bored with your house, you do something to spice it up. What do you do? You just move the furniture around a little bit. See, that's what we've done in God's house. When we got bored with God's house, all of a sudden, instead of encountering an altar, the first thing you encounter is a laver. You, there's no altar anymore. So follow me now. What happens then is this is the sanctuary that we have. There's no altar. And Romans chapter 12 verse 1 says that we must present our bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. But if there's no altar, and all of a sudden to just get people into the church, we begin to just only have a labor and we do away with the altar, do you see why we'd have a problem? So we have a labor. Now, let's break it down even further. The devil's goal was to always sit above the mount of the congregation in where? In the side of the north. Now what sits in the side of the north in the sanctuary? The table of showbread. So the devil says, if I can get control of the table of showbread, I've got him. So all of a sudden what the devil does is he introduces the new versions of the Bible. And so what he'll do is he'll bring a new version of the Bible into you and you think you have the truth. And I put the NIV Bible, which I call the HIV Bible up there, because I'm telling you, you cannot prove our message from the NIV Bible. Now, in, you know what? I don't want to pick on anybody in here, but does anybody have an NIV Bible with them in here right now? Just raise your hand. Praise God. So we're just, we're just going to have you read a couple things for us, if you don't mind. Okay, now, first of all, if you could, if you could just, just stand up, brother, and you could just read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. Because this is a key text to us, the Seventh-day Adventists. Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. If you could just read that for us, so that we could see, because we discovered the other night that in the book of Galatians chapter 1, the Bible says, if any man come to you preaching another gospel, let it be what? Accursed. Let it be accursed. So let's see if this Bible is a curse. Could you read that to us, my brother? And there's somebody else over here that had an NIV Bible. Okay, sister, could you read for me Matthew chapter 17, verse 21? Go ahead. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. See, this is an important text to us. A very important text. Because let me just read it from the King James so that we know what we're looking at. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. Let me read it from the, let, just let me read it real quick from, from this Bible so that we know what we're looking at. It says, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Okay, my brother. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but the entering the most holy place. Okay, do we have, does anybody have a problem with what that version just read to us? Okay, why do, why do we have a problem? Because it says that he went from the ascension directly where? Into the most holy place. Is that what he did? No, he did not. He went into the holy place, and in the holy place is the whole ministration of Christ. Now, sister, would you stand up and would you please read for us Matthew chapter 17, verse 21. Matthew chapter 17, verse 21. No, 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 we need 21. Okay, but there's a 20 and there's a 22, right? 21 just gone? Yeah, it's not there. You know what, there's over, you know what, there's over, you know what, here, sister, now stand right there and read me Matthew 18, verse 11. There's over 200 verses in the NIV Bible completely gone. Not even there. Matthew 18 verse 11 is not listed. It's not listed? I see a 10 and a 12. 
Yeah, okay. I have a problem with that version of the Bible, brothers and sisters. Do you? See, so the devil said, if I can set above the mount of the congregation in the side of the north. Now look, in, my, in John, chapter, John chapter 14. Turn with me to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Now we need to find out what is the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, verse 26. The Bible says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring you all things into remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So, if you have a Bible that doesn't bring back every word that God said, is there a need for the Holy Spirit? No, because he's going to lead you into all truth. He's going to bring back all things to remembrance. He's going to reprove the world of righteousness and of judgment. Amen? So, what we, what we need to understand is, if, there's no, if all of a sudden we bring in the false word of God, there's no need for the Holy Spirit. So why are we in the condition we are as a people? When you do that, there's no need for the Holy Spirit, so we must create one. So now all of a sudden what we do is we bring the swing, the sing, and the celebrate. They're talking about the minding and all this other foolishness going on in the church. Why? Because we must create a, fight, a false fire. We must create a Holy Spirit. And so when we bring in this swing, sing, and celebrate to replace the Holy Spirit, why? Because we did one thing. We removed the altar. The devil told the first lie in the Garden of Eden, he says, thou shalt not surely die. And he's telling us the same lie today. You don't have to die. You don't have to climb on the altar. Jesus loves you. He loves us all. And he's going to save us all. There's two theologies going on in the church today. And I'm telling you what, both of the thieves on the cross tried to preach theology. The one thief said, Lord, save us. Save us all. Save us in our sins. And the brother showed it earlier in his message that the one... He recognized that Jesus was the spotless lamb. He recognized he was a sinner, and then he said, Lord, save me. That's the two theologies. Don't save me in my sins, Lord, save me from my sins. And that's the theology we better stand on. But we have played with God. We have moved the furniture around to make it fit us so that we could be a bigger, better people. But you know what? We're weaker. Look at the prophet says. Look at the prophet says. She said to secure an increase of numbers. To, a, to a, the acquisition of members who have not been renewed in heart and reform is a source of weakness to the church. The fact is often ignored. Some ministers and churches are so desirous of securing an increase of numbers that they do not bear faithful testimony against unchristian habits and practices. If somebody's smoking and drinking and, and, and living according to the world, when, if you remove the altar, when are you going to tell them that they can't do that in God's church? After you baptize them? You're going to put them in the water and then tell them, well, you know what, we don't really do that. I have been to crusades before in my younger experience as a Christian in a Seventh-day Adventist church where they'll tell you everything, but they don't talk about the health message and they don't present Sister White. Now, how can you be a, a Seventh-day Adventist with either one of those? But they said, you know what, we'll, we'll tell them later. Tell them what? After they've already become a member? Look what she says. She says, those who accept the truth are not taught that they cannot safely be worldlings in conduct while they are Christians in name. Heretofore, they were Satan's subjects. Henceforth, they are to be subjects of Christ. The life must testify to the change of leaders. You didn't change leaders. You still are under the same power of the devil claiming to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And it says, public opinion favors a profession of Christianity. Little self-denial or self-sacrifice is required in order to put on a form of godliness and to have one's names enrolled upon the church books. She says, henceforth, many join the church without first becoming united to Christ in this Satan triumphs. Why is he having a heyday in our church? Do you think, you think the Lord, when he told Gideon to bring out the people, do you think he was caught up when it came down to 300? He could have done what he did with three. God is not caught up in numbers in any way. We're caught up in numbers. I'll tell you what, you know what? The prophet of the Lord says, stand up and preach to one, though you preach to a thousand. You know what? I'd preach the same sermon today if there was five, one, fifty. 
The Lord said, preach to one as though a thousand. But you know what? We get excited when all of a sudden 500 or 1,000 people come in amongst us. But how many are true in heart? How many really are going to make an impact on this world when they go out? How many are really hearing? She says that we have created a new party of professed believers. Look, look at this. The church needs to awake. It needs to what? Awake. awake to the understanding of the subtle powers of satanic agencies that must be met. That's why I tell people all the time, it's the hireling that flees when the, when the wolf comes. It's the hireling that takes off running. Somebody needs to stand and dig into the trenches and say, I'm going to hold the line. I'm not running. The problem is, is we must be, learn to be wise as serpent, harmless as doves within our churches. Man, how much more could you, would you win somebody if you would ask a question instead of make a statement? You know, when I first came into the church, someone handed me, it's the spirit of prophecy. And you know what? I, I didn't believe in Ellen White. I, I was one of those that just didn't believe. And I was one of those that thought, you know what? If we have cookies and cakes and donuts at Sabbath school class, we can reap everybody to come to Sabbath school class. I used to be one of those. So you know what? We would bring all the stuff. And for about the first about the first month, man, we had a whole bunch of people at Sabbath school class. But you know what? A month later, we had the same amount of people. All this foolishness doesn't bring people into the church. It don't bring people into the church, and it doesn't keep the young people in when you start doing all that foolishness either. Because God said, he said, you know what? I would that you were fully in the church and on fire or fully in the world. But you're trying to be both places at once, and it makes me sick. Isn't that what he says? Let them go. Let them realize that, you know what, there's no, there's no beauty out there. There's nothing out there for me. So that when they have a place to come back to, it's a shelter for them to come into. We're so worried about keeping them in the shelter and they're lost in the shelter. Man, Lord, help us. See, we're trying to do everything in our own wisdom when we need to say, Lord, whatever you say, I'll follow. Whatever it is that you place in front of me, Lord, I'll listen. A new, party, a new party of professed believers. If they will keep on the whole armor, they will be able to conquer all the foes they meet. Amen. You know what? I got the strangest phone call last night. At about, about I don't know, at 12, 15, 12, 30, some there, when my daughter called me from back in Bozeman. And she says, man, Dad, she says, I was just talking to one of my friends, 17 years old, and, and he's, been, man, he's been wrestling with demons. He's actually seen demons. And, and I, I need to help him. Dad, tell me what to tell him. Tell me what to read him in the Bible so that I can cast a demon out of him. I said, you've got to be kidding me. She goes, what? Isn't there, isn't there something I can read him? I said, man, that prayer, that kind only comes out with prayer and fasting. You don't play around with that foolishness. I tell you what, we think we can just, oh, we can just magically cast a spell and demons flee. No, you can't. You better be prayed up and ready and have the whole armor of God on you start playing with things. See, you, you want to come into the church and you want to cast out, and I'm telling you what, they're full on demons in these churches. There are demons in these churches, and you want to come in there and you're going to meet them head on, you'll be like the sons of Ziba. And you'll be running down the road naked, beat up. Why? Because you think, oh, I can just cast some little magical spell. No, we need to know Jesus. It says confederacies will increase in numbers. She tells us that. It's going to get worse, not better. And powers as we draw near the end of time, these confederacies will create opposing influences to the truth. Have they done that? She says forming new parties of professed believers who will act out their own delusive theories, the apostasy will increase. So I'm telling you, today, know it ahead of time. The apostasy is going to get worse, not better. Don't be a part of the apostasy, though. That's the difference. As the apostasy increases, you do not have to be a part of it at all. But you don't have to flee either. Amen. You do not have to flee. Here's where we stopped the other night. Many who embraced the third message had not had an experience in the two former messages. Satan understood this and his evil eye was upon them to overthrow them. But the third angel was pointing them to the most holy place. And those who had had an experience in the past messages were pointing them to the way of the heavenly sanctuary. Many saw the perfect chain of truth in the angels' messages and gladly received them in their what? In the order. 
Have we gotten out of order? God hasn't, but have we? Now, I was sharing with you the other night that what we do is we are on a systematic system to win people into the church. So when we have a crusade, what we'll do is we will make sure that when we bring them in the first night, we have one week to share the health, because we start in Daniel, Daniel 1, Daniel 2, we get to Daniel 2, we share the health. We go on, we get to the time, times and laws were changed, we share with them the Sabbath, we get them the mark of the beast before they ever get back to their Sunday church. Am I right? Because if they get back to their Sunday church, we want to make sure we gave them all the information first, so that now, if you don't keep it, you're lost. So what we did is we didn't give them any power to keep it. We didn't give them any victory whatsoever, but we placed a heavy yoke upon their neck and said, hey, you got the same yoke I got now. And you know what? A lot of us look at it that way. A lot of us look at it that way. You got the same burden. If you don't keep it, you'll be lost. So now we didn't give them one bit of victory. Now, if we give them the message in its order, what is the order? Turn with me to Revelation. Revelation chapter 14. We need to look at the order. And we need to follow the order. This is where we've got off. This is our problem. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. It says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a what? Loud voice. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. And Mrs. White says, to give glory to God is to reveal His character in your own. What message is that? That's the message of righteousness by faith. The very first message that we are to give people is the message of righteousness by faith. But instead we give them everything but. And you don't give them any power to do anything. Because are you that are accustomed to doing evil, are you able to keep the Sabbath holy? No. Are you able to eat right? No. See, what we don't want to admit, we're sinners. Every single one of us in this room is a sinner. And you know what? We do what sinners do. We sin. That's what you're supposed to do. Now, are you that is accustomed to doing evil all of a sudden going to start doing good? No. So what is the mindset? You know what? I hear people saying it all the time. I see, hear people saying, Lord, help me quit smoking. You hear that? Lord, help me quit drinking. Lord, help me do this. You know, I looked it up. I looked it up on the computer in Sister White's writings where it says, Lord, help me. It says it 43 times and not one time does it deal with it dealing with sin. Not one time. The Lord isn't trying to help you do anything. Now follow me. He's not trying to help you do anything. He's trying to help you to die so that he can live. Are we teaching the truth in love? Are we teaching the truth?